Hogstock. Hello, everybody, and it is now summertime. I can tell because I'm already sweating in my little studio I have here that has no air conditioning in this room. Uh, welcome to the Hogstock. <laughs> Hey, this is your host, Alex. Uh, we got Jamal. We have Steve. Everyone's at home, uh, which is nice because I think Jamal's been on the road for, uh, you know, the last two shows in a row, maybe. Uh, yeah, I would have been on the road today if it wasn't raining, but yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, you, I'm in here now. Yeah, I, yeah. Alex, how do you not have air conditioning in a room in your house? Uh, well, because of how I'm sure this room was added on to the house, they just never ran any oh. HVAC to it. And Interesting. I'm not, you know, going to pay for that right now because I've got I, I just bought a water heater for my other house. So, you know, I'm a little on the light. So. He's a bougie dude who has two houses that I inherited one. Thank you. <laughs> well, for what is for what is worth, Alex, at least you don't have to uh, deal with a whole house who doesn't that doesn't have AC right now. Um, oh, do you not have AC yeah. in your house? No. And it's been three weeks now. I'm, I'm waiting on. A, I'm going through my home warranty program and, and these guys are taking their precious time getting mm-hmm. everything situated and i find they finally got the parts that they needed uh they found them and had them shipped to them so i'm expecting it to get done this upcoming week the actual work i had one of those Fingers home crossed. warranty i had one of those home warranty companies and i fired them because i don't want to give them a plug by saying who they are because of just massive gross incompetence and they lied to me and and uh you know, those, some of those home warranty companies are tough. Yeah, I, I think uh, we've all had those horror stories with that. I, and Jamal, I feel really bad for you because I know this has been that first gross week we've had in D.C. in terms of, like, you know, humidity is here and all that. We had two nice weeks, and now we're into, like, nasty summer. So I mean, um, my house yeah. has three separate air conditioning units, and so, right. like, when it all falls apart, it's triple my expenses, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jamal, you might want to get a window unit if they keep stalling. No, nah, I, I I just figured I'd tough it out. Um, okay. Only because only because well now that you all you all are going to know now, which is fine. But I'm I'm in the process of I'm about to get ready to sell my home too. So it's like oh. I'm not about to put too much money. If I got a home warranty program, I'll just tough it out. I'm not about to put too much money in this in this house in terms of like HVAC stuff. I'll sure. just get it replaced. Um, and then once that's replaced, I'm ready to move on. Uh, hop on out I'm of there. Sh- I'm sure your yeah. Siberian husky appreciates the total lack of air conditioning. <laughs> she is actually she yeah. I, I had to take her to my folks' house. She's at my parents' house. She's oh. been at my parents' house for like a week and a half now. But I ain't I ain't leave them out to dry because I know they didn't ask for it. So I, I come over. I'm actually about to head over after our show. Um yeah. and and uh and be over there with Dakota. So I usually walk her during the like midday or in the morning if they aren't mm-hmm. around. So to to help them out. So yeah. You yeah, yeah. She's definitely not here. It's like 85 degrees in this house. So I want to get, yeah, it gets, it gets rough. Do you want to disclose your future living arrangements or keep that to yourself? Uh, keep it to myself because I, I really don't. Um, I, I mean, I know what I want, but in that same, it's still gonna be a townhome, but probably just get a little bigger space. Uh, for sure. me and my dog. Um, so you just move. You're also, not. There's nothing. You're, you're just moving to another place. <laughs> Uh yeah, long story. I mean, it's it's a it's an investment opportunity, but I just want I want a little bigger space now, mm-hmm. and given where I am with like my equity, I can I can come up on some cash here. Um, this is a, yeah. a older home. It's very annoying to deal with. Like the HVAC, the it it shut down because it's it came with the original parts of the home. Like this this home was built in 1987, and the AC has never been replaced. So, of course, when I took on this home, I had to deal with everything that came with it. I already had the yeah. water heater replaced. Um, now the AC got to get replaced. Um, there were some other things I had to deal with, but uh, I ain't staying around for that stuff. <laughs> I'm going to let yeah. somebody else take care of it. I, I, I hear you on that one, because that's the exact same age as my the house I inherited. It. So, like, and my dad never cared about replacing anything. Like he he was he's not a good homeowner type when I so he didn't we had a thirty three year old water heater I think something like that it was I just yeah. replaced mine last year it ain't cheap it ain't cheap uh luckily I have a good handyman up in the woods so uh all anyway, right why don't we get into the show show uh I guess we got to start with the big story and we're all gonna fight about it Jack Del Rio fined a hundred thousand dollars this week. 
for comments he made, started with comments online, then he started talking in pre the press conference about January 6th and the Black Lives Matter protests and riots that happened up in Minnesota, or Ball they never really specify which riot he was talking about in anything I've seen. Um, so, you know, it's a whole, whole blue. We all knew Jack Del Rio's politics. I, I don't think anyone will, should be surprised by what he said. Uh, to me, the interesting thing, or two parts. One, him talking in a press conference about his politics was a little surprising. Uh, and then the second thing, I don't remember a team ever finding an assistant coach uh, for comments they've made in a press conference. I like I, I the NFL's fine coaches. I've seen that. I've never seen a team find a coach or an assistant coach. Before. Well, it doesn't mean that they haven't. We just maybe it wasn't news. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, okay, I want to be before this discussion happens. I want to be very clear about what he said. So I'm gonna read sure. this now. I'm reading this from NBC Sports Washington, a, a column called "Del Rio Defends Tweets on January or on 2020 Protest, January mm -hmm. 6th Capital Attack, dated June 7th, and it is uncredited to an author." So this is the comment in the presser. The presser quote. Why are we not looking into those things? If we're going to talk about it, why are we not looking into these things? I can't, I can look at images on TV. People's livelihoods are being destroyed. Businesses are being burned down. No problem. And then we have a dust up at the Capitol, nothing burned down. And we're going to make that a major deal. That was the press conference quote. Now there were multiple tweets. So the first one was a tweet by some blue check mark dude named Norm Eisen. I don't know who that is. And he has a long series, a, a, a tweet about uh, the January 6th committee hearings and something about a Brookings government right. report. I'm not going to read that. And so Jack Del Rio's tweet was, quote, would love to understand the, quote, whole story about why the summer riots, looting, burning and the destruction of personal property is never discussed. But this is hashtag common sense. Then the next thing that he sent out. Somebody named Miles Grant, who is not a blue checkmark person, so I assume he's just a regular person. Right. Is, oh, by the way, I looked up Norm Eisman is a former U.S. diplomat. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. So that's who he is. And so Miles Grant, I am going to read his t quote, his tweet. Miles Grant wrote, black people begging agents of the state to stop executing them. White men trying to overthrow the results of a Democratic election and violently assaulting cops. Same thing, according to Dan Snyder's defensive coordinator. And then Del Rio found that, responded, said, um, yeah, sure. And with a little emoji that has a long nose implying you're lying because that that's what yes, he's implying. It's a Pinocchio emoji. And then. He came back in the presser and said, and I don't know, I might be getting these in the wrong order, but um, from Del Rio in the presser, quote, Anything that I ever say or write, I'd be comfortable saying or writing in front of everybody that I work with, players and coaches. I express myself as an American. We have that ability. I love this country, and I believe what, what I believe, and I've said what I want to say. And then Rivera says everybody's entitled to their opinion. Um, but then the team, Rivera put out a statement. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because yeah. I, I know I, I just want to help you out with the order because I, okay. I, I, was, I was trying to follow. So basically, the tweets – of Jack Del Rio was everything that's is that's what started everything. And then right. after the tweets of Jack Del Rio, Ron Rivera made his comments in the presser. And after Ron Rivera's presser, Jack Del Rio started with what you just mentioned okay. about the being American and things like that. And then after those comments about being American and speaking whatever he wants he transitioned to what you ver your very first statement okay, right. from jack del rio he so, transitioned to um football for a second and then came back to his comments and spoke on um why aren't they doing like comparing he just compared it to the first thing and I then wrote. Yeah. yes and the then first you, yeah and then the last thing is the statement that you're about to read okay so yeah. yeah, and so I had it out of order. Thanks NBC for putting it totally yeah, out of order. Yeah, NBC put things out of out <laughs> of completely backwards, order, basically which totally is, back. Yeah, and annoying. so so then Ron Rivera put out a statement on Twitter, which I only saw because somebody posted it in our comments section. Yeah. This is the latest one. Yep. Yeah, and I'm gonna read this whole thing too. 
This morning I met with coach, this is a quote. This morning I met with coach Jack Del Rio to express how disappointed I am in his comments on Wednesday. His comments do not reflect the organization's views and are extremely hurtful to our great community here in the DMV. As we saw last night in the hearings, what happened on Capitol on the Capitol on January 6, 2021 was an act of domestic terrorism. A group of citizens attempted to overturn the results of a free and fair election, and as a result, lives are lost and the Capitol building was damaged. Coach Del Rio did apologize for his comments on Wednesday, and he understands the distinction between the events of that dark day and the peaceful protest, which are a hallmark of our democracy. He does have the right to voice his opinion as a citizen of the United States, and it most certainly is his constitutional right to do so. However, words have consequences, and his words hurt a lot of people in our community. I want to make it clear that our organization will not tolerate any equivalency between those who demanded justice in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the actions of those on January 6 who sought to topple our government. After reflecting on the situation and the circumstances, I've decided to find Coach Del Rio $100,000, which the team will donate to the United States Capitol Police Memorial Fund. I feel strongly that after our conversation this morning, he will have a greater understanding for the impact of his language and the values that his team stands for, close quote. That's from Del Rio. That is from Rivera. And I guess I didn't read Del Rio's apology. Yeah. So let's Which, do that. by the way, just for the record, I don't believe that either Del Rio or Rivera wrote either. PR of wrote both of them. There's yes. no question. So here was Del Rio's apology tweet. And this is another quote. I made, the com I made comments earlier today in referencing the attack that took place on the United States Capitol on January 6, 2021. Referencing that situation as a dust-up was irresponsible and negligent, and I'm sorry. I stand by my comments condemning the violence in communities across the country. I say that while also expressing my support as an American citizen for peaceful protests in our country. I have fully supported all peaceful protests in America. I love, respect, and support all my fellow coaches, players, and staff that I work for and respect their views and opinions, close quote. And that is, I believe, the entire story. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I just want to, I thought it was important to have everybody yeah. hear all of it word for word. Sure, sure. Um, and like I said, I don't buy that either Del Rio or Rivera wrote that. It was um, a classic PR thing, something like yeah, I would have it, written. It's written like PR. So <laughs> yeah. it's PR. Because um, I don't think, I, I think neither of them is that eloquent anyway oh no they're football so, guys yeah. it's uh, it's written i'm telling you it's written by a pr yeah. guy and somebody like me reviewed it that's what happened right, exactly. the general counsel looked at it and said yes yeah um so i think to me and i said this at the beginning uh when, when we were starting i'm fascinated by the fine because I, I don't think i've ever seen that before at least not that kind of price tag on a fine of a coach um i I wonder if he would have been fined if he hadn't said anything in the press conference and kept it to Twitter, because obviously he's he's tweeted some crazy shit before. Like, that's not unusual for Jack Del Rio. Yeah. Um, and no one seems to mind that. It's well, I, look, I he's a political if, conservative and people think he's nuts for it. Well, it's no, not I, just that he he's into like the QAnon level. stuff. Is probably. he? I mean, I'm not. Yeah, the QAnon. He's, is he's nuts. literally he's literally tweeted in support of fake news like the literal the literal fake like fake accounts and factually incorrect stuff like yeah, he, he retweets that kind of stuff all the it's time. been debunked that's the stuff that he that's I've, the stuff that he goes out there in support of and i've never looked at a single of jack del rio's tweet other than what i just sure. said sure yeah you good. i mean i don't either it's only when he does something egregious and other people you know repost yeah. it i don't they, follow him yeah. so it pops up on my timeline I, i've seen it. Yeah, I've seen his uh, kid also is on Twitter, and his kid has to do the "my dad's an idiot" thing more often than not. <laughs> Isn't uh, the kid? Is the kid a coach? Yeah, in, in what, he's like a do. QB assistant or something. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, which you know, nepotism. I love, I love nepotism. That's the way the NFL runs, man. I know nepotism. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the whole thing. This team can just not help itself without like creating some kind of non-football controversy for more than oh, two weeks. And it's drive, it, it drives us all nuts. You know, this, this doesn't need to happen. Obviously, there's now fallout where, uh, and I think they're just using an excuse, but the Virginia legislators are basically saying now the any deal with Virginia is dead in the water because of this, which I don't think it's because of this. I think it's because of something else. They're just saying this. Well, look. But, yeah. Okay. So everybody knows I'm a political conservative. Let's just get that out up front. Sure. Um, I thought what Del Rio said was inartfully worded. 
to call something in which somebody died a dust up is inappropriate. That part, no. Um, the substance of what he was saying, I agree more than I disagree with it pretty strongly, in fact. But here's the point to me. Why are you doing this? You're a football coach. Right. There's no reason to do this. There's no reason for him to be on Twitter at all. You're not making money on it. It's not getting you anything. Now it's endangering your livelihood, and it's cost you money. Why are you spouting off on Twitter about anything? I think it's the stupidest thing ever. Um, Twitter needs to just be resigned, in my view, to advertisements for conduct. If you want to advertise Top Gun, go ahead. But I think people in the public eye like Del Rio need to not say anything on Twitter. That to me is the story. I mean, I don't, I think he was inartful in what he said for sure. Um, I think there's a serious lack of awareness, uh, maybe on his part, not realizing you live in a city that felt directly attacked and was directly attacked because of the Capitol thing. Uh, and that's going to have consequences. I, I don't want to make this comparison because obviously what happened on 9-11 is significantly bigger because of how many people died. If a coach of the Giants said anything about Al being pro-Al-Qaeda during 9-11, he would be fired. Well, that's not even close to what he did. It is close to no, what it he isn't. did. No, it isn't. He wasn't supporting the, his city. He wasn't supporting the Capitol rioters. I, what he was saying was that that for right or wrong what he was saying was it's been minimized or it's been it's been overhyped rather and the black lives matter riots were minimized that was what he was saying that's wholly different than saying i support al-qaeda he didn't come close to that analogy at all he didn't say i support the rioters a capital the capital thing was was a good idea that's not what he was saying that in, was that same, point, in that same vein the man i so in that same vein, the the minimal minim, minimal for first of all, we gotta we gotta talk about his apology because clearly, like you said, it's PR it's PR related and and then clearly they don't understand the 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 important part of doing research with Jack Del Rio. But minim, minimalizing, I'm gonna struggle with that word forever. Yeah. God <laughs> God help me. Um, the the situation at the Capitol, whether the adjective he used in the the public light is what he wanted to use. That's still how he felt. Like he didn't, he called it a dust up. Okay, sure. In the public, you're not going to use that word, but in private, you're probably still going to consider it uh, something insignificant compared to whatever else you want to, you want people to focus on that, that what, what aboutism thing, whatever it, that they always say. So right. with that being said, it has nothing like we transitioned to the, the statement itself, the apology that came shortly after he said these things mm -hmm. in the media, they tell him, uh, to say all these things, and he supports peaceful, peaceful, pro peaceful protests. And it dawned on me, he was the same. He was the same coach who literally. I said it dawned on me. I, I never forget, but I just said I did have to dig it up. Um, I'm gonna read this quote or this paragraph line from a time in 2017 where he was still the coach of the 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 Oakland Raiders at the time. Yeah. Here we go. After Colin Kaepernick's protest went public in August 2016. Dale Rio was asked his thoughts about Kaepernick's decision to sit down during the national anthem. At the time, Dale Rio made it clear that he didn't want any of his players protesting unless they were planning to do it on their own time. And I transition back to what they said in his PR statement. Again, to Alex's point and Steve's point, this is PR related, but it's also completely evident and obvious that he ain't saying nothing this nothing like this because if you were in support of peaceful protests, you would have never said the quotes as you said four or five or oh, six years ago. My math is off. Six yeah. years ago. So so I say all that to say when you're saying things like this in a public light, um, I don't like in, in, in apologizing shortly after, I don't think you really first of all, you, you signed off on the apology, but clearly it's not your words. Um and you should have like if if you're gonna stand on something, I appreciate the fact that he did because um, first of all, you know where you are uh, in terms of, you know, where you view things. He didn't delete many tweets. Like, some of that stuff is still up there. Like, you, you know where you stand um, in, in that light, but there's a lot to uncover when we're talking about what he said, but the consequences behind his actions are, should be the priority of the conversation. Like, I don't have a problem with any coaches or football players 
tweeting on tweeting online. Wade Phillips is one of the one of the better coaches in the NFL in NFL history, and he tweets all the time. Like, I, uh, to be fair, Wade gets on his phone. Mostly um, having fun online, though. He's. I not, just think it's stupid. But that's I'm what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It. I think Alex, it's stupid. That's what I'm saying, Alex. Like people, it's it's okay to have conversations and tweet online. I think that the difference is Jack Doe Real doesn't really come up there to have conversations, like pure conversations outside of whether it's just football or politics. Like he doesn't have anything else. Like it's just football or politics. And that's where you need to be like, sure, Jack, like you don't have to do the politics side. You can stay far away from that. And you can, I told, I said it, I said it the day of, I said, man, we already know who Jack is in terms of like his political beliefs and his viewpoints. It's okay if you don't tweet anything. You can still like every single thing that you believe. You can hit the like button on every single tweet that you believe because those aren't your words, but that is what you, that is, that's how you feel. Like it, keep liking it, all that stuff. You can, if you want to go as far as retweeting it, go ahead. But in that same vein, just just stay away from it in terms of like actually using your words and your opinion to put that out there in a space where you have to manage or you're a part of managing 53 players, um, 22 of them, uh, possibly being on your side of the ball because that is the that is the part of the consequences that that people are uh, are more concerned of than anything else. Uh, and on the whole thing with him in Oakland, there have been there's been a lot of talk over the years that his outspoken politics on the whole Colin Kaepernick thing is part of what cost him his job in Oakland. Uh, you know that was a whole like that lost him the locker room and. That's why he got fired. And there was, what, four years, three years after he got fired in Oakland before he got a coaching job again in the NFL? Like, he was basically gone from the league I think for our three ne- seasons. I think. Yeah, well, our our hire of him was the next job that he got after he got fired. Yeah, Wasn't he in ja- – oh, that was Jackson was before Oakland. When- yeah, 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 he so was look. in Jacksonville for 10 years. Then he was coordinator for Denver when they won their Super Bowl. Okay. Um, so here's the point. And, and again, I'm more on Del Rio's side than not on most of his opinions, just to be abundantly clear. And I'm not going to hide or run from that. No, no, no. I don't, um, I don't think anyone would expect you to. I agree with him on the general, he phrased it really badly, but the general point that the Capitol riot on January 6th, which was a couple hundred morons in the Capitol building, ultimately didn't do much damage with the exception of the one young lady who unfortunately lost her life and then compare that to and then compare that to uh six total protests which resulted in riots which resulted in more than a billion dollars of damage i mean that's sort of being minimized that's kind of what he was trying to say and I think he has a point. But here's but what I'm trying to say here really is that if you were in the public eye like this and you're not a political analyst, you're not a community leader, you are a football coach with who is coaching a variety of players of all different backgrounds, why are you for God's sake, why are you spouting off on Twitter? I mean to that's what uh, Jamal, I agree with you there. It's like you can believe whatever. And if he's into this QAnon stuff, those people are nuts, uh, you know. It's all a bunch of just weird conspiracy theories and garbage. Um, but I just don't understand why he would want to spout off on Twitter about anything and talk in a press conference about any politics, anything. Talk about linebackers. We're going to talk about linebackers later. Talk about that. Nobody needs or cares to hear. It's like Steve Kerr does the same thing, and Steve Kerr needs to shut his mouth also. Um, it's the same problem. Nobody wants to hear your politics. You're a football coach. You can't teach me anything about politics. That's, I think, to me, the lesson of all this. And in terms of his apology, I mean, yeah, PR writes it. The you know the general counsel will approve it, but Del Rio has to agree to it too. So, because sure, it's a quote but, from him, and so I mean, he didn't go farther because he didn't want to go farther. That's I, that's I, why I it's also like assume, that. you know, we'll see how long does it take for him to you know do some to step on another nail. So I, to personally, uh, to me, if I was Del Rio, I'd have quit. Um, you know, he probably, unless he needs the money, I mean, hopefully he doesn't, you know, he's made a lot of money, uh, but I would have quit. And I think, for a lot of people. pardon me. I said that would have been good for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would have quit because I think it was despicable that the, uh, the team find him any money for espousing opinion, even an opinion that everybody, dis- a lot of people disagreed with and was poorly stated and all that we just said. Team has no business whatsoever finding him, and that disgusts. Players me. get cut for stuff like this, man. 
for saying yeah. for saying words. They get cut. I mean, look, so in the end, is a slap on the wrist. If if I Del Rio hadn't said it in a press conference, I don't think he would have been fined. I, I said that at the beginning. I don't I, know. I just based off of the team's past history, where he this is probably the fourth or fifth time he's tweeted something out like this. They didn't do anything. Uh, the first couple times. The, he, this is the first time he said something in a press conference. Uh, so that's my gut t- yeah, feeling it's is that same. that's probably the straw that broke the camel's I back. I tell him and I tell Steve Kerr, who are on dramatically opposite sides of the fence, to both shut up. Talk about well, basketball and football. The, Steve Kerr has one advantage del, over Del Rio, and that is that Steve Kerr is very good at his job, whereas Del Rio is... Just another coach. Yeah. Like, I went back and looked at his, like, numbers season by season. There was a span of time where he was an elite defensive coordinator. But that was, like, 15 years ago. Like, more often than not, his teams finish in the mid-20s, and then he has an occasional, like, top-five team. You know, so, like, yeah, I that's mean, so not I think what you're there. saying is he doesn't necessarily have the capital to right. um, spout off stuff, whereas Steve Kerr isn't going to get fired. Steve Kerr could you know, advocate for Nazis and still not get fired, uh, you know, sure. I, and I'm exactly. being, well, I'm, that's, he, he got I'm exaggerating, crazy. you yeah. know, but the point is Steve Kerr could say almost anything and they're not going to yeah. fire him because he's put together this very unique team in basketball history, whereas Jack Del Rio's teams consistently underperform. The Certainly Washington's defense, you can blame players, blame him, has not been what anybody thought it would be and it probably won't. And so does he have really the chutzpah, in the political capital, if you will, to spout off and piss everybody off? Probably not. Right. But I again, mean, I would have quit if I were him, not in, you know, in after the fine. That would have been my response. I mean, I, I was surprised by the fine. Still, I still yeah. am. Like, to me, it's, like I said, I don't think I've ever heard of a team. I, I can't remember that, and I'm sure some coaches have been fined uh, before. Like, I can't believe they didn't find that guy who was snorting coke off the desk in his office. You remember him? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> I well, mean, did that guy get fired uh, instead? Like, I don't know, but I, I'm sure somebody's been fine. But I agree with you. I can't remember yeah. one. Joey Porter is one. All right, dude. I know he got he got fined for some shit he got into with uh, against like the Browns um, yeah. as an assistant. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it happens. Joey Porter yeah. got fined. Two people got fined. Um, matter of fact. And and understand um, that I mean Del in terms of Del Rio. A hundred thousand dollars is not to him what it is to us. Obviously, he's making a well, lot of money. And the other yeah, thing I'll is, that's what it was. depending on how this charitable donation is structured, it could if it comes from him, he could take the hundred thousand as a tax deduction, right. which is how the NFL player fines work. I believe you know, believe it or not. So if it's the same, then it's not it's not a hundred percent loss for him. No, 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 and. and- I don't know what his contract is. I don't. Do, I don't we don't really ever get assistant. No, it's not ever made public, and so we don't know what they are. Yeah, I, I remember a few times like Greg Williams back in the day. They publicized his because it was, at yeah. the time, the highest assistant coach contract in history. Yeah. I don't and, know. I didn't even try to find it, and I don't think it's yeah. public info. Whatever he's making. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's a safe to assume he's making a couple million. You know, like probably, that's yeah. I would think he's he's in that ballpark. So it's probably. Uh, I mean, look, hundred K still sucks. Like it's that, probably like yeah. a few hundred bucks for the rest of us. Yeah, yeah, something along those lines. Maybe a few thousand even. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, th- I had to take a 20% pay cut once. That wasn't fun. I mean, it also, I don't know if the fine is something he has to write a check for or if they're just going to deduct it out of his pay or yeah. what. And that yeah, yeah. was unstated. No. And who knows if it'll even happen. You know, they could also just say, hey, we're going to find him. And Well, uh, yeah, who knows? There's no proof. No one's, no one's going to see the check. Um, well, right. actually, they know they probably will see the check because charitable donations, they're donating some, what was it, a police fund or something? The, the, oh, the charity will see the check, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that might be public info, would it not? And perhaps, possibly. Probably. So, yeah. I, I don't know that fund very well, even though I know people who work for the Capitol, or the Capitol Police Department. I don't know. Yeah, that I don't know the fund at all, but that's yeah. possible. That could arguably be public knowledge. Yeah. All right, why don't we uh, switch gears here? Uh, there were a couple things that happened in OCAs this week. Uh, the story that I know I saw was how Jeremy Reeves apparently got a little too physical, uh, went helmet to helmet with Diami Brown on a play, 
And apparently Ron Rivera lost his mind when that happened. Called the entire team together, stopped the whole practice, and dropped, from what I remember reading, something like 15 F-bombs in a two-minute speech on them to, you know, play smarter. Uh, so that was one story. And Jamal, you said you saw something about Curtis Samuel as well. Uh, that Curtis yeah. Samuel was, what, he was on the sidelines again? Um, no, it's the first time this year, but uh, he was, I'm trying to look it up. He was on yeah. the side field, though. Well, I, sorry, yeah, when I said that again, I meant, like, just like last year. <laughs> that, you know, he, he's uh, not fully participating. He's being held out, out, out of caution. I'm, I'm shocked. Yeah. I'm stunned. Look, in terms of this, I mean, I, the first I've heard about this at all is when Alex mentioned it five minutes before the show happened. But my first reaction was, what really, what was this about? It Was it just, like, two guys squaring off? On mm-hmm. the field, that happens all the time. It sounds like this might have been a little different and, like, Reeves, you know, went helmet to helmet or something. And if that's the case, yeah, sure. I mean, fuss at everybody, um, you know, Rivera. If it was yeah. just something le- – I find it hard to believe that it was just, like, a push and a shove kind of thing. So, no, I think it's got – it must have been something hard enough where you're worried somebody got hurt, you know? Like and obviously you don't want your own players hurting each other in practice. No, of course not. Um, yeah, Curtis, I I'll circle back to um the hit, but Curtis, uh, overall the the injury description, wide receiver Curtis Samuel overall soreness and running back Antonio Gibson hamstring did not participate in the most recent session. Uh, Rivera said that Curtis was a rest day out of an abundance of caution. He mm-hmm. had a real good day on Monday. Worked really hard. He came in the next day, and he was a little bit tight talking with them and talking with the trainer. We decided, hey, let's just be smart. Um, so those are the initial comments. He said more, but that's all we really need uh, for mm-hmm. that one. Um, in terms of the hit, uh, essentially they, they outlined it as um, it was just a regular play. Honestly, if you if you think about like just football in general and how things happen, like literally how things just, just happens, um, uh Rivera actually I don't even think Rivera saw the play itself um based on what I remember reading but uh Carson Wentz dropped back and threw a uh I think it was a tight window throw to Deami Brown obviously and Jeremy Reeves was on the field defensively and trying to I guess trying to make a play and ends up hitting uh Deami and um Deami's hurt hurts his shoulder for a second but he's able to get back up and uh, he's able to continue practicing but Rivera I guess heard or seen the aftermath, and that's when uh, you hear everything like that because uh, I guess he's assuming that you know somebody's over there head hunting or, or trying to trying to do too much in practice, and mm-hmm. um, I would imagine that's that's what he thought, uh, rightfully so, especially if uh, he didn't see it or assuming that he didn't see it because that's that's what I remember hearing. Um, then rightfully so, you're going to have that type of uh, that type of I guess those those. Because it wasn't, like, the comments, obviously, F-bombs, if that was the most he's reportedly been furious, then I guess I can't explain that type of reaction. But the thought process of, hey, let's be careful, I can understand that. I mean, Rivera strikes me as more of a, kind of like Joe Gibbs. Like, I don't think of him as a coach that probably, you know, flips out very often on his players. Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, yeah, he's charismatic and presents well in front of the media but he's still mm-hmm. an nfl football player a coach i mean i think he gives the vibe of being a regular coach so this doesn't surprise me at all joe gibbs was a bit unusual i mean in that regard joe gibbs was christian and you know he had very 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 firm and strong beliefs and uh, you yeah. know joe gibbs he was, was one of the only coaches i remember hearing never cursed yeah right and that's rivera is uh, more in the mainstream in that regard, if you will. So this, if he dropped a bunch of F-bombs, that doesn't surprise me in any way. No, that doesn't surprise me necessarily. It's more that I, we haven't heard of him kind of like freaking out on players or anything. Like, like he, he, he does, like there's never been a story that I can remember of him, you know, getting that visibly upset during a practice. Not so. that I remember either, but again, it doesn't surprise me in... I mean, I, I just don't know enough about whatever that happened to 
really have right. more comment than that um, on it because again, I no, they're, they're, they're I haven't been. been I don't lot. know anything about what's happened in any OTAs. To be perfectly honest with you, uh, I mean Curtis Samuel being injured too, or being on the sideline with Titan list. It reminds me of Malcolm Kelly, or uh, if you want to go way back, remember the kicker John Hall that we had, yeah. who would get hurt yeah, actually all worked the time. Out with the Eagles, right? John Hall. Yeah, dude. yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I think he he missed something like eight games in one year. I always he, thought Malcolm Kelly had talent, but, right? You know, but he was just one of those guys that just couldn't stay on the field and yeah. all of that. I think Curtis Samuels obviously been more successful than Malcolm Kelly ever was, you know, and his 2020 season was, was a pretty quality season, Yeah, yeah. but, um, I, he just, maybe he's one of these guys that can't stay on the field either. Maybe that's just who Curtis Samuel is. Um, yeah, I, that one's kind of weird. And if I take it from the wrong perspective, he does a, he tries his best to always control the narrative. Like mm-hmm. he really does his best in those words regarding Curtis Samuel taking uh, a day off out of an abundance of caution. It's like, uh, for me, who are you trying to convince? Like, is it, is it us or is it like, it's him. like your, yourself? Because you don't, you don't want to face the fact that you, you, you kind of made a mistake there. Now, again, this has nothing to do with Curtis himself. Like, obviously we hope for, for Washington's sake that Curtis is actually healthy, but in that same vein, you know, you don't have to do all that. Like, if he's he's on the sideline, you know, he's on the sideline. I remember, um, dang, I wish I remembered the player. This was recent, too, so I, I don't remember the player. But somebody had something done with their knee, like a cleanup or something like that. And one of the reporters said the word surgery um, or operation and Ron Rivera snapped at him, saying that like, you need to pay attention and, and listen. This ain't this ain't no surgery or operation. Um, this was like a week or two ago. Uh, but I say all that to say, like I, I just don't, I don't get it, man. I, 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 it's it's eventually these things will catch up with you, and that's that's where the, the issue is for me. Like you say all these things, and people, you know, they take your word as something uh, that you you know you they hold they hold tight. And hold it against you, or, or hold it with you, if, whether it's for good or for bad. And I, I just don't understand why you always got to do that with Curtis. Like, if he's on the sideline because he's sore, just say he was sore. Um, take that for what you want, et cetera, and and, and keep it, keep it pushing, man. I just think it's a story because he was injured all last year and yeah. tried to come back and played five yeah, minutes and was out again and all that stuff. That's why it's a story. Yeah, it's a story. I, 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 I don't, I don't disagree with that. My my thing is more about Ron. It's like you don't have to. I say, I get I get your that. paranoid. Yeah, I get yeah. your paranoid because of what they may say. But in that same vein, like you can't you can't control how everybody views the situation if they know last year that guy was hurt all the time. Like you can't control yeah. every single person in that media saying it's abundance of caution. Abundance of caution. They're still gonna have their thoughts after you say something like that. Like, well, it may it's, also it's be a truth. bit of may also be a bit of a defense mechanism for Rivera because he's the guy who he's the one who brought Samuel in here and he was supposed to be Mr. Gadget player and you know the the sort of Christian McCaffrey of Washington a little bit if you will Mm -hmm. and none of that happened and the guy was hurt and maybe he's just on the defensive more about um, Samuel than he would be uh, for normal players yeah yeah Yeah. Uh, I mean look it it, it, it's very likely that if Samuel's hurt again this year, he might not he might not be around very long after that. You know what I mean? Oh no. So if you want to hear about his contract, let's talk about yeah. his contract. Um like on the wrong part of the spreadsheet. Okay. Uh <coughs> excuse me, that's guards. He's not a guard. No. Okay. So Curtis Samuel was three years, thirty four point five million. He's um yeah window in the way he had 21.5 million guaranteed at signing and then another million and a half guaranteed later his cap hit this year is 12.65 million his um his dead cap this year pre-june 1 was 11.1 million but it drops to 3.9 million at june 1st mm-hmm. um, meaning he they could be cut today at a savings and then next year he's got a 13 million dollar cap hit 7.2 million dollar dead cap 
then 2024, it's 4.8 million with a 2.4 million dollar dead cap. So, or uh, yeah, 4.8 and 4.8 in 2024. So, uh, oh, that 2024 is a dead year. So it's just the last his last year is is uh, next year. So yeah, I mean they could cut him at a big savings, and he may be gone next year no matter what. All right. Why don't we? Uh... I'm about to say I personally wouldn't be upset. Um, yeah. I was trying to do the math. Um, actually, funny walking my walking Dakota at my folks' house yesterday. Um, I don't remember what I was listening to that made me think about it, but um, I was thinking about, you know, the reason why they got rid of uh Adam or excuse me, let me be more clear. The reason why Adam Humphreys and Kurt, uh, uh, DeAndre Carter aren't on this roster anymore. I'm um, not saying that they chose to re- they wanted to resign and all that stuff, but the reason why they're not on the roster is because you have a Curtis Samuel returning, you have a Deami Brown returning, uh, or excuse me, yeah, Deami Brown coming back, uh, hopefully approving. Then you have Don Dotson. These are people that are uh, able to fill the roles that DeAndre and Adam filled in one at in one season. I don't I don't know what happens if things go south for for Curtis again, like. Uh, sure. I mean, Dax Mill is a, is around, but um, he doesn't provide that versatility that Curtis Samuel can. Like, I, I don't. I, I just. I just don't know exactly um what their plan is if Curtis Samuel isn't around because clearly he was uh he's gonna be around because you're expecting him to be healthy. You don't need DeAndre if he's healthy. You don't need Adam if he's healthy because you have uh Jahan who can play all three positions um and then some like I. I don't know. I just don't know what it's going to look like without Curtis Samuel around in terms of productivity. Uh, I, who knows? You know, it's tough to say. I just think that, I mean, they've been without him since day one, basically. So yeah. they can continue to be without him, you know. And I've always kind of looked at Antonio Gibson as, as a long, in the same vein as Curtis Samuel just – kind of on the other end of the fence and you know Gibson's a running back in the NFL but he can receive and Curtis Samuel's a receiver who can kind of run and uh, I mean I just think the answer would be uh Antonio Gibson's role expands particularly if Brian Robinson um comes through and is sort of the traditional NFL power back you know interior right. gap power guy and you got JD McKissick there too with that right. same skill he's set. like the Brian Mitchell uh, of yeah of the modern yeah. day um, all right, well, we should uh, wrap up the show with our linebacker breakdown. Uh, the position I think we're probably looking forward to the least in, the, in a way because it's paper thin, really, when you talk about the linebackers we have on this roster. Uh, we have two starters, right? Jamin Davis and Cole Holcomb, and that's it. <laughs> they don't even have a third linebacker <laughs> starter at this point, which is going to be an interesting thing to watch for here, guys. Uh, but let, why don't we start talking about Davis and Holcomb, uh, and we'll talk Holcomb first. Uh, it's his, what, his fourth season, fifth season now with the team? Um, fourth. Fourth. Good find by Jay Gruden back when he was here as head coach. This was one of those guys that he kind of grabbed in the draft that he really wanted, I remember uh, hearing at the time. And he's worked out pretty well for being, you know, a day three pick. Uh, you know, I know he's not an elite starter, uh, but he is probably our best linebacker at this point on the roster. Uh, he's definitely going to be the middle linebacker, it sounds like, uh, for the team when they play a, you know, middle linebacker 3-4 or 4-3 set. Um, um, so why don't we start there? What are your guys' thoughts on Holcomb? Cole Holcomb's a jag, okay? I know Washington fans like the guy, but as a non-Washington fan, I can tell you that I view him as a jag. You know, he was a fifth-round pick. He plays like a fifth-round pick. He's certainly a high, intelligent football player, high energy, all of that. But I don't think his I think his physical abilities are limiting. I think his play strength is limited. But at the same time, his ability to cover tight ends is also limited. So I think in, on a better team, he would be a guy who's a quality backup. But in Washington, he's a starter because, as Alex said, they literally have two starter-worthy linebackers 
and neither one of them have proven that they're quality starters. Mm. You know, but then you're down to guys like David Mayo if you need another starter. So I, I just I think Cole Holcomb's uh, fine. You know, fans root for him however you want, but I don't think he's anything special, and he's not going to be anything special in terms of NFL performance. Um, I think that holds some weight. The the jag part, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I think that holds some weight. It's hard to really say because I, I plan on I plan on looking at a ton of guys that I got. Well, I'll take that back. I don't have that much time, but I'm gonna try to look at a number of guys before we get to training camp. And that's that linebacker. That whole front seven is is part of it. But with Cole, that's where I viewed him as just a guy. Um, that same vein as Steve, but I think. Uh, what we're not accounting for is that middle linebacker role that Mike Guy. Um, what did the now? I'll finish the statement. Let me go ahead. What did the coaches see in him through the film review after the season to say, you know, he is a viable option there? Now, there are some legitimate things in terms of film study that people are going to be able to pick out in terms of traits. But Cole also said that this is something that he wanted to take on. So when you have that that leadership ability and somebody who is willing to prove themselves, that is a dynamic, that is a, a characteristic, a skill set that we can't account for um, in terms of if, uh, t- tangible, like tangible evidence. I think I mm-hmm. use it right. Like we can't account for that. Um, and that's that's an intangible thing. Like that's that's all within that's all within him. So. Who knows how that boosts his his, his, his skill set, his production on the field in terms of being able to be responsible for those guys on the field. But um, I, I don't know how much better he can be or how much better he will be moving into year four. This is also a contract year. I just thought about that. It's also a contract yeah. year for Cole Holcomb. Um, so who, who knows like to what step or how, how much of a step he takes. But uh, Jag, I agree with for now. But I can't. Account- there's some things that we just can't account for, and I will also be interested to seeing like how good did he play when he was at uh, that Mike spot. I mean, the the Mike question or who plays middle linebacker, it's just as much about who's really the play caller for the defense this year. Um, and, and like you said, Steve, he is a jag, but he's a very highly intelligent player. So I'm less worried about him with that aspect. He, he's been here four years. He knows the league. I think he's got plenty of playing time under his belt. So I'm less worried about him calling plays than Davis, who's still fairly young and green and didn't get a ton of playing time last year. So I, I think it makes sense for them to put him in that role just for the play calling ability. Because uh, it's not like we have anybody else who, who obviously fits it. Honestly, Cole Holcomb reminds me a lot of Will Compton. There's a lot of that. Yeah, I, I mean, they're both. They were both similar in attitude, high energy, mm-hmm. you know, smart football players, limited by physical li- limitations. Right. I would say uh, Compton know, that's, probably a little bit more so than Holcomb. Yeah, even, oh, but, I think so. Yeah, but yeah. the same same kind of thing. But you and, know, I was but, a big Compton fan just because he did have that like good team attitude. He was fun to root for. I mean, yeah. that's different than. And in terms of, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's a play calling thing. I. If I were a coach, I would not want Jamin Davis to have to worry about play calling this time. Um, so, yeah, you're kind of stuck with Cole by default, really, unless you want to throw David Mayo in there. But right. honestly, also, the other thing is, last year, the Redskins were had two linebackers on the field for most of the year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that changes well, the way the linebackers operate. Yeah. So it, calling him a middle linebacker is almost a, a misnomer. I think it was less than 10% of the snaps that they yeah. play. And that was by line. default because they didn't yeah. have a third linebacker. But right. still, I mean, if that's going to be the case this year, um, you, you kind of have to, and you have to do a film study to figure it out. But that sort of redefines the roles of what the linebackers are doing. Right. All right. Well, why don't we jump to Davis? Uh, you know, we've already kind of touched on, he had a down year for his rookie year. Uh, but the coaching staff and the front office obviously thought very highly of him if they drafted him in the first round. Uh, what do you guys think? Do you think they'll uh, we'll see anything, any big jump from him to kind of reward Rivera's risky um, pick there, or no? 
I think the team was foolish for ever thinking he was a middle linebacker. I think he never was a middle linebacker. Mm -hmm. I think he always was a weak side linebacker, and that's a role he knows and more fits his talents. And so I th actually think that you will probably see a better Jamin Davis this year uh, because he's going to be used more towards his skills. What are his skills? He's athletic. He's a pursuit guy. He can uh, be much better in coverage mm -hmm. and can match up favorably with some of these athletic tight ends. Um, so I think, and you don't want Jamin Davis to get caught up in the middle in the, in the junk and all that. So I actually think he's much better suited to like a backside pursuit type of role mm -hmm. than anything else. So I th actually do, if they keep Davis in that role, I think you're going to, you are going to see a jump now, whether or not he'll ever be worth a first round pick. I mean, who knows? I mean, he's only in year two. He has time to prove himself. Um, but I think you will see a better Jamin Davis this year. That's my view. Yeah. Part of my theory. Now, I'm starting to think that this was actually more than a theory, but, uh, part of my initial theory after the draft, because uh, free agency had passed at that point and they didn't really at attack linebacker in the draft either. My theory about uh, how they're feeling about this linebacker group um, and, and why they didn't re-sign Landon outside of the fact that Carson Wentz had that big deal and they couldn't afford to restructure a second time for Landon or, or that Landon didn't want to take that second restructure offer. Um, I think that they had plans for Jamin and and even Cole, and a lot of that had to do with the front four, and that's a lot of, to do with Fredarian Mathis, and I think that they, they feel like Fredarian, again, this is the linebackers group, but I think that Fredarian is going to make their jobs easier, and that's why I'm bringing them in there. Like, the things that he does on the line as a selfless teammate, as a selfless player, he's going to be able to unleash or unlock the, the playmaking ability that Jamin Davis can have uh, on the second level, and even Cole Holcomb to a degree, depending on, you know, which way the ball flows and things like that. Um, and also uh, another additional statement to this thing when it comes to Jamin, uh, I kind of agree with Steve in that, um, you know, weak side, strong side, whatever side, but mainly weak side. If you're going to do that, uh, that I'm not even going that be in, I'm going to say be in. I don't want to say that full term. I'm tired of I'm tired of saying it after a thousand times being used in the media and in articles and stuff like that. But that being um uh, 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 position, I think that uh they 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 have ideas for using Jamin as a possibility as well because uh, in a traditional sense, uh that's also like your your Leo linebacker, um your your weak side a defender who just has some frame to him, who can play in the box, who can cover your tight ends in space, who can cover the slot position to a degree. That's all that that role is, that Jack guy, all that, all that, that, that joker, all that stuff, all of those terms are wrapped into what a BN is. Um, so I, I think that's kind of the idea for, for Jamin is, um, wow, they're looking at um, Cam Curl, the three safety looks, and they want to keep all those three safeties on the field. In that same vein, I think Jamie Davis uh, can still uh, have an impact in those those positions that they want that they want to use or utilize the most. I would just like to thank you for not saying the words "bn" out loud. I, I hate it. I'm annoyed. I don't think very many people even understand what the hell they're talking about when they use the term. To be honest with you. Um. Yeah. So. I think. Washington, from a on the field standpoint, is lesser by not having Landon Collins in that role you're talking about. That is where he belongs. That was what he did very well with the Giants. He's not a backside deep mm -hmm. safety in a cover three. He's not even all that great in a cover two, but he it does fill that hybrid, you know, be in role very well. And I can understand about the money situation. But I think the team would have been better by having him on the field, money not being a factor. Um, and I th yeah. also think it's interesting that Collins hasn't resigned with another team yet. Yeah. So I maybe that's well, a money thing. I don't know. But that it, part it might be. It, it could be a money pride thing. Like he doesn't want to take a cheap deal because he was making a lot of money before. Uh, well, let's talk about a guy who could kind of fill that role for them. 
Kalik Hudson, who's now in his third season with Washington, he's uh, he's not that same kind of guy that Collins was, but he's uh, you know, six foot oh, 220. He kind of played more safety than a linebacker in college. Uh, his role there was more just to be almost like a, a speed rusher uh, than anything else. And that I think that was kind of the vision when they brought him in, too, was he, he's a safety linebacker, but he's mostly going to go for the quarterback. I don't know if they have really ever utilized him properly in that respect. I know he's played some special teams, but and that's about it. Uh, but now with Collins gone, maybe this is time, his time to step up into that role. Well, whether or not he can is another matter. I mean, that's sure. clearly what they drafted him to do. We really have no evidence one way or the other. I mean, he hadn't got on the field really at all. Uh, you know, the not lack of much. evidence might be the evidence. <laughs> yeah, well, that right, that's the case. But certainly, that's clearly what the team drafted him to be was exactly that role. I mean, the Michigan called it the Viper position, yeah. and uh, who was the guy before Hudson? It's now in the NFL filled it. I mean, that's a key part of. Um, Michigan's or Michigan's defense. So, right. but I just think you're right. I mean, people, especially when you're a draft pick, and Hudson was. Let's see, what round was Hudson? Fifth round. Um, yeah. I, I just think he would have forced his way on the field if if his talent level was higher, and it hasn't, and he hasn't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't have much to say about uh, Philippe. To be honest with you, um, I I've, I said. Probably like 2020, I think, or yeah, 2020. I or was it last year? I, I, yeah, it was last year. They, they was initially looking at him last year. Um, you know, I said that you know it was a possibility based on his traits and what I, again what it was described to us because I, I didn't look too in deep in detail on Philippe, but um, you know what his traits was described and when you see him in preseason, he's not even making like an impact. Like he ain't, he's not flashing. You know, mm-hmm. his name ain't being called. You don't see any athletic traits popping out. He doesn't play as he doesn't play as big as he should be in the box. Um, and you know, it is it's a wait and see. And I hate that we do that, but I mean it's the truth. It's hard to it's hard to give an opinion on every single player because especially ones that's that's either new or hasn't had enough time because the coach you're going to see so much more in practice that tells you that these guys aren't ready yet. And to Alex's right. point, when you said the the lack of production or, or even seeing the field kind of tells you uh, a lot more. Than, than than we than we're saying like it tells you a lot more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially on a team with an atrocious linebacker group. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, number four, David Mayo. Uh, pretty much just a special teamers, but or teams players, not special teamers, but <laughs> special teams player. Uh, eight years in the league. Uh, he was with Rivera in Carolina. There's some talk that he might be the third linebacker. I just don't see it from what we saw him last year. He's not well, very impressive on the field. Nobody said he's going to be yeah. in the Hall of Fame. But, I mean, if you're a Washington fan, meet your primary backup linebacker. Right. I mean, I think without a doubt. He's um he's really the only one of this group that's left that Alex hasn't brought up yet that has any sort of significant experience. Yeah, everyone else is either a rookie or one Under, year. A bunch of undrafted player. free agents, right. Yeah. And so Mayo's the guy who at least knows the NFL. You know, he can come in and not embarrass the team on the field. Now, the reason why he isn't a starter is that he isn't that good. You right. know, but he's not at that level. But I think the guy is very clearly and obviously your next guy up in this linebacker mm-hmm. group. Yeah. And if they yeah. want three starters on the field, it's got to be him. I mean, three uh, traditional out two outside linebackers, one in one middle linebacker. If they want that, it's, it's Mayo's got to be the next guy. Yeah, uh, I mean, see. also if you're talking about body type, a lot of the guys who there's one, two, three, four, five, six, six unknowns who will go through quickly, but they're all small. They're none of them really. I mean, he's probably bigger than any of the others, except for maybe one guy, who I see is five pounds heavier, but. Mayo's the only one who's got that traditional linebacker build, it looks like. I about to say, y'all said everything that I really had to say. Uh, backup guy. Um, again, I don't know too much about him, but he did. He filled, he filled I don't know, how, how many games did he play last year? I know he played enough defensively where it's like, 
Um, it made sense to bring them back in terms of being and being a solid backup. But uh, if you're talking about starting or anything like that, I I don't know too much about that. But it's kind of along the lines of like the John Bostic thing. Like if they wanted to bring somebody back, it would have like John Bostic would have been the same idea as a um um uh uh. uh, uh uh, David Mayo. Sorry, I don't know why I blanked on his name for a second, but I think it would be the same idea. So, um, I'm trying to see how many games he played. Like, oh, I got it. It, it was quite a. No, I mean, he started. My bad. My bad. He four. started four. Yeah. Four. Okay. Yeah, I'm about to say he played. He started a, a good number of games to get like a sample size on him. Um, so that's why I was like, it may, it probably makes sense. Like they either was thinking between Bosick or Mayo and said, uh, if we're going to run with these young linebackers, <laughs> we'll use Mayo as as a rotational piece. Right. Um, solid backup, uh, but primarily special teamers, and I, that's probably where they lean. Now, now keep in mind, last year I I pulled up his numbers in uh, Pro Football Reference. He only played 16% of the defensive snaps, uh, but he played 70% of the special team snaps. That's really, I think, still why he's here. I, I think they love him as part of their special teams group. Uh, which Personally. Is, yeah, you need that, so... Yeah, personally, I don't understand why the Washington coaching staff didn't want to keep John Bostic another year. I don't like either. And he remains a free agent. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's available to sign. This, um, this team has no desire to sign anybody. It, it, the, yeah. I, I don't know what this uh, scouting department does because it doesn't seem like it's a lot. If uh, I was a fan of this team, I'd be pretty upset as yeah, about it, how they're, they're, they manage their free agent – they're free agents, especially. Yeah. All right. Time to go through the unknown guys. And It'll take 20 seconds. Look, yeah, let's yep. go through the 20 seconds. Because I don't think we know any details about any of these guys' career, um, for the most part. A lot of rookies. So I'll do the ones who have been around for one season first. We have Dejon Harris uh, out of Arkansas. He is 6'0", 245 pounds. So he's at least got some weight on him. Uh, I don't know anything about him. I don't think anyone else does. So there, that's one guy. You got Milo Elfer, or Effler, uh, out of Illinois. Eifler. Yeah. Another small guy, 6'2", 225. So another weak side linebacker there. Farad Gardner, rookie out of Louisiana Lafayette. Was he a draft pick? Gardner? Yeah. Hold on, I got it right now. He's an undrafted free agent. Okay, he's an undrafted free agent. Yeah. Uh, 25 years old. Oh, wow, that's surprising for a rookie. Uh, 6'1", 215. Uh, so probably more of a safety than a linebacker at that size. Uh, Bryce Notre, Notre uh, Southern Illinois, rookie... 6'3", 225. Trey Walker oh, I got to say about out of Idaho. Who's six Bryce Notre? By all means. Yeah, yeah, I got something. I'm just playing. I ain't got nothing to say. Oh, <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> you know Bryce Notre? <laughs> My goodness. Trey Walker, rookie out of Idaho. And then we got Drew White, the rookie out of Notre Dame. Uh, so, you know. I don't know anything about. Drew White if they're yeah. Notre Dame fans. So. I don't know anything about any of those players who no, you just said. No, why would we? Why would anyone know any? I look forward to seeing them in you know preseason because I'm hoping one of these guys shows something. Uh, I think I'm the team would be in crap. trouble if they don't. Right. You know, somebody. Here's the good news for these guys. Two of you probably can make the roster. Like I, I think the team will still probably keep six linebackers. That'd be my well, guess. So that's where we're going to wrap this up. Yeah. So the roster locks, obviously, Jamin Davis, Cole Holcomb. Um, I would Mayo. think. Yeah, I guess. But if Mayo really, really underperforms, it, they have cut veterans before. Washington has this sure. coaching staff. Um, so it wouldn't wholly. So they cut Eric Flowers, if I recall. <laughs> Did they not at first? Yeah, they yeah. got Eric go. And that other, they two years ago they had who was the uh, safety they had they cut, regardless. So it wouldn't surprise. So I don't think he's a roster lock. Um, I think Cleek Hudson probably is, just because he's got he's a 
draft pick. But beyond that, those three, I mean, it's a total. And, yeah, Mayo, certainly. So if there's one or two spots left, God only knows who's going to get any of them. Yeah, I, I, I mean, and, look, I know we're not a traditional 4-3 team. Like, they don't play a lot of three linebackers looks so much. But assuming they do, like, usually you'll keep six then. Because you need a lot of linebackers for your special teams anyway. So, I I mean, look, it's going to be a total toss-off. We'll see We'll see who impresses us in training camps and preseason. Uh, but none of these guys stand out physically or – you haven't heard any of their names even by, like, reading what's going on in the OTAs yet, which is not a good sign. Well, it probably mean if, if none of them have been mentioned, and I'll take your word for it, Yeah. I guess that means that nobody's standing out. Yeah, that's what I mean. You know, when Will Compton came in as an undrafted free agent, people said things about, hey, this guy might actually be decent. I'm not seeing that now, so. Yeah. I mean, All right. shout out to shout out to his uh his post his post playing endeavors. He got a really apparently a really uh, I struggle to listen to it, but a really good podcast. So a little podcast network. Is he doing something with Barstool? Is that right? Uh, I don't know if it's I would I think so. I know yeah. it's I know his co-host is with uh Titans his Titans his Titans teammate. So maybe that's probably where he things took off for him in terms of like post post playing. Mm-hmm. careers and stuff like that is is his his time down in Tennessee. Yeah. All right, well, that wraps up linebackers. Like I said, the thin group from this team, probably the thinnest part of the roster. Uh, other than yeah, you could even argue that special teams is deeper because we have two kicker, kickers right now. <laughs> and you're only going to need one. Um, so All right, guys, that should wrap up this episode. We will see you all next week. I hope you have a good one. Later.